evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, and welcome to the 25th Annual Graduate Student Symposium in the History of Art, hosted by the Barnes Foundation in partnership with Bryn Mawr College, Temple University, and the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Martha Lizzie, and I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education at the Barnes. This is the Barnes's fourth time hosting this symposium, and I have to say it's become one of our favorite um, programs of the year because we get to connect with colleagues from all over the region, um, but most of all because we get to hear exciting new research from um, being done in the field of art history from graduate students in nine of the top programs in the area. And those talks happen tomorrow and next Friday. Tonight, we kick things off with our keynote lecture by Dr. Jonathan Katz. Welcome, Jonathan. In a few moments, my colleague Tom Collins will introduce Jonathan. But first, I need to thank several people. Um, thank you to our co-organizing institutions at Bryn Mawr, Temple, and UPenn. This, this year, Bryn Mawr was our lead partner, so a special thanks to Professor Lisa Saltzman. Thank you, of course, to all the students who will be giving papers tomorrow and next Friday, and to their advisors for um, being here, being here to introduce them. Um, thank you to the Barnes Foundation's amazing AV team, especially Gillen Riggs and Thomas Costello. Our AV team always plays a big role in um, any symposium that, that we present, but um, never more than this year when everything has to be done through screens and technology. So um, just thank you to you guys for being so good at what you do and so pleasant to work with always. And finally, a huge thank you to my talented colleague, Aliyah Palumbo, who did an incredible job of organizing this whole event. Um, it was an especially complicated undertaking this year, and the amount of detail and planning that went into it was truly staggering. So now I will turn things over to our fearless <clears throat> Barnes Foundation's Newbauer Family Executive Director and President, Tom Collins. Good evening, everyone. And Martha, thank you for the kind introduction. I can't say that I've been fearless uh, this year, but I appreciate the props. And thank you to you for all of your work coordinating uh, this program. It is my great pleasure this evening to introduce my delightful friend and brilliant colleague, Dr. Jonathan Katz. An art historian, curator, and activist, Dr. Katz is a scholar of modern and contemporary art, and a pioneering figure in the development of a queer art history. In the 1990s, he became one of the first full-time American academics to be tenured in gay and lesbian studies at SUNY Buffalo. He is now Associate Professor of Practice in the History of Art and Interim Director of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Katz is well known for his cutting-edge curatorial projects at museums all over the country. In 2010, he co-curated the groundbreaking exhibition Hide Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. This was the first major museum exhibition to focus on sexual difference in the making of modern American art. Hide Seek won the Best National Museum Exhibition Award from the International Association of Art Critics and the Best LGBTQ Nonfiction Book Award from the American Library Association. His next major exhibition, entitled Art AIDS America, traveled to five museums across the United States. In 2019, he curated About Face, Stonewall, Revolt, and New Queer Art at Wrightwood 659, a new museum in Chicago. It will be available in book form in 2021. Jonathan is currently organizing a major international ex exhibition called The First Homosexuals, which explores the very first representations of sexual difference after the coining of the term homosexual in 1869. 
Dr. Katz has certainly made his mark as a queer activist as well. He was the founding director of Yale University's Larry Kramer Initiative in Lesbian and Gay Studies, the first in the Ivy League. He founded the Queer Caucus for Art of the College Art Association. He founded the Harvey Milk Institute, the world's largest queer studies institute. And he is the president emeritus of the new Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art in New York City. Jonathan is now at work on two new books, Hiding in Plain Sight on the Queerness of Contemporary Art and The Silent Camp, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg and The Cold War. He is also editor of the forthcoming Rutledge Companion to Queer Art History. Jonathan's lecture tonight, A Viral Theory of Art, AIDS and the Aesthetics of Protest, looks at the AIDS pandemic and its connection to art and contemporary activist art, exploring how and why protest today so often resembles the very forms it works against. Will you please join me in welcoming the truly excellent Dr. Jonathan Kapp. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that very much. A very kind introduction. And my thanks to uh, Tom and to the Barnes in general for hosting this. And a special thank you to Aaliyah uh, and to Martha, uh, to Home and to Lisa from Rumar uh, for making all of this possible. So let's begin. This is what disease looks like at the moment immediately before it becomes an epidemic, when it's but a set of disconnected symptoms. As it transforms into an epidemic or worse, a plague, this cluster of symptoms ceases to be individuated for it acquires a new social dimension. And the once lone sufferer becomes a carrier, their body uh, under a threat they can no longer call their own. For now, it, it menaces another body, that collective abstraction we call the social. The minute the social body is threatened, the martial metaphors routine in the fight against disease assume an altogether different, darker, even sinister cast. For they are now aimed not at the illness, but against its sufferers. We cast not as sick people, but as vectors of contagion. Soon the die is cast, and one is either a friend or an enemy, us or the other. Thus epidemics efficiently turn disease into social pathology and remap the etiology of infection along ruthlessly segregated battle lines. What I'm showing you is literally the first AIDS painting, or at least the first I was able to find over the course of about 10 years of research in the field. Painted by the Israeli artist Izar Patkin immediately after a routine visit to his dermatologists, it abstractly depicts the blue-black lesions known as Kaposi's sarcoma breaking through a skin here of yellow latex at a human scale of exactly six feet. Kaposi's would soon become a familiar sign of AIDS infection, and I distinctly remember that about half the men in my gym in San Francisco would soon become spotted. But this painting was done, Patkin affirms, in 1981, one year before AIDS or even GRID, its previous utterly symptomatic handle, abbreviating gay-related immune deficiency, was coined. Patkin reports that at the dermatologist's office, he sat in the waiting room bracketed by three or four men all covered by these unfamiliar lesions. As a gay man, he'd also heard rumors of this new gay cancer attacking the community. So he went home and he painted this work remarkably prescient in moreover naming it Unveiling of a Modern Chastity. It was a very early recognition of how this new affliction would both change gay men's social and erotic lives, which we understood then as if not identical, certainly closely adjoining. While Patkin's title hints at a social dimension to the painting, the image itself is resolutely embodied. Phenomenological, for AIDS, not yet a plague, was at this early phase an affliction borne by its sufferers alone. 
But as David Wanarovich once said, quote, I didn't realize when, that when I contracted a disease, I contracted a diseased society as well, end quote. He recognized that epidemics surface inequity. There's nothing like sickness and death to unequivocally materialize one's standing in the social hierarchy. And the more sickness and death you witness, the lower the rung you occupy. Epidemics, whether AIDS or COVID, do not equalize everyone as potentially vulnerable, but conversely, they work very hard to solidly, materially differentiate one from the other. Epidemics are therefore among the most formative, albeit uncredited, social forces in human history, and they have sadly always worked in one direction to consistently reify extant social hierarchies. They do this through one of the most potent forms of ideological sleight of hand, naturalizing repressive social distinctions, offering a biomedical rationale for current social prejudices, then proclaiming this division of the haves from the have-nots as but a necessary health precaution. Whether we're talking about AIDS or COVID-19, Ideological containment and social segregation are as much symptomatic of any epidemic as the disease itself. I often hear that we have AIDS to thank for the resurgent attention to and victories in the queer rights struggle today. AIDS, the thinking goes, moved queerness into general discourse and thus enforced a renewed political attention to our causes, a harbinger of our more recent victories such as marriage equality. But nothing could be further from the truth. For AIDS actually set back the queer rights movement by decades. It did so first by reifying a divide, at least in discursive terms, of the at risk from the not at risk. In effect, shoring up the cleaving of one America from the other at precisely the moment when this opposition was finally beginning to break down. In the late 1970s, after all, pleasure palaces like Studio 54 soared precisely because they mingled celebrities with hot gay men running in public. When a famous old gay bathhouse, the Continental Baths, where a young Bette Midler uh, once entertained, became Plato's retreat, a straight sex club, and the village people became a huge crossover hit, it was clear that the pre AIDS buffer between gay and straight culture was finally eroding. And even as a young gay man, I felt that. But soon AIDS would not just rebuild, but strengthen that dividing wall through instrumentalizing the notion of contagion and its always unspoken obverse purity. In its wake, musty stereotypes associated with queerness, including the notion of an invisible taint that sickened the young entailing a miserable life and an early tragic death, all came roaring back, horrifically made real through AIDS. In facilitating the creation of a false binary between the inherently diseased and the inherently healthy, AIDS allowed people to temporarily forget the legion of other threats to their well-being, from the savings and loan collapse to the Iran-Contra scandal, while rallying around a vision of necessary social hygiene that has been responsible for many of the greatest of human cruelties. We can see this play out in real time. Watch what happens in 1981, the year Patkin painted his unveiling of modern chastity, chastity but long before there was any general awareness of the new epidemic AIDS. Bob Colicello would write in his book on Andy Warhol, quote, at the end of summer, Andy and I were on the Eastern shuttle on our way to the Reagan State Dinner for Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. That same year, as I'm showing you, Nancy Reagan graced the cover of Warhol's interview magazine, giving readers the very first interview with the new first lady since she moved into the White House, an interview conducted by Colicello. This was a highly politicized placement, as numerous periodicals wanted that first interview, but Warhol's interview won it 
largely on the belief that they could recast boring old Republican conservatives as hip, cool, youth-oriented, and even gay-adjacent. As she was, literally, in the pages of the magazine, where her interview shared copy space with the work of an emerging photographer named Robert Maplethorpe, along with homoerotic imagery by the great historical queer photographers George Platt Lines and Herbert List. Clearly, absent plague, the now familiar battle lines did not yet exist. But by 1982, but a year later, with the emergence first of grid, then AIDS, everything had changed. And of course, by the end of that decade, it was a completely different world. With the Christian right in rapid, rapid ascendance, AIDS mowing down huge swaths of my age group, and the queer community maligned as having brought about happily for far too many its own destruction. So when on June 12, 1989, Christina Orcahill, director of the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, canceled the Maplethorpe retrospective, The Perfect Moment, a few weeks before its opening and a few months after the photographer's death from AIDS, she was, in her own words, protecting the institution she directed from censorious congressional oversight, apparently doing so by doing the censoring herself. Undeterred by her performative self-censorship, Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina, nonetheless, then took to the Senate floor and proclaimed, quote, it's an issue of soaking the taxpayer to fund the homosexual pornography of Robert Maplethorpe, who died of AIDS while spending the last years of his life promoting homosexuality, end quote. So you're looking at the cover here of Art Forum magazine chronicling our protest against the Corcoran's cancellation by projecting the images of that banned exhibition on the white marble walls of the museum at night. By this point, the question of federal support for any art that even tangentially acknowledged either queerness or AIDS had been so brilliantly and repeatedly manipulated into a wedge issue by the Christian right and the Republican Senate that no less an authority than Ronald Reagan's spokesperson, Gary, Mar Gary Bauer, would remark on TV in 1987 that the reason the president hadn't so much as uttered the word AIDS until 1985, at least three years into the epidemic, was due to the fact that, quote, it hadn't spread into the general population yet, end quote. That's why in the famous first museum work about AIDS, Grand Fury's public-facing window let the record show from 1987. Reagan is featured alongside other AIDS criminals, as the window called them, superimposed over a photograph, you can see that in the background, of the Nuremberg trials that had assessed Nazi guilt after World War II. But the placard, as you can see, in front of Reagan is empty, for he had nothing to say. Not so! Some of the other AIDS criminals, such as an anonymous surgeon who was quoted as saying, we used to hate faggots on an emotional basis, but now we have a good reason. Or televangelist Jerry Falwell's, AIDS is God's judgment on a society that doesn't live by his rules. Bill Olander, a friend and the openly HIV positive uh, head curator of the mu new museum when it really was the new museum and not yet sutured to the art market, told me that he commissioned the window installation because at that point, five years into the plague, there had been literally no museum engagement with AIDS anywhere in the country. Much more characteristic of the museum field were the remarks of the celebrated director of the National Gallery of Art, J. Carter Brown, when asked about the Maplethorpe, Maplethorpe controversy as it was blooming. And he said, we have to keep the First Amendment rights apart from the controversy, as if the decision to cancel wasn't already a First Amendment issue. But it was Senator Jesse Helms who repeatedly and aggressively worked to twin queerness and AIDS into one single collective threat against America. From his call for the creation of federal quarantine camps for the HIV positive, in defense of which he said, quote, we used to quarantine for typhoid and scarlet fever and it didn't ruin anyone's civil liberties to do that, end quote. 
to his infamous Helms Amendment to a huge AIDS bill that in the terms of the amendment prohibit the use of any funds provided under this act to the Center of Disease Control for being used to provide AIDS education, information, or prevention materials, or activities that promote, encourage, or condone homosexual activity or the intravenous use of illegal drugs, end quote. He thus managed to turn a funding bill for AIDS, not only to a frontal attack against its two most at-risk population queers, and IV drug users, but then rob them of the information necessary to save their lives. In a truly chilling barometer of the national mood, Helms's flagrant discrimination passed the Senate by a vote of 94 in favor and two against. This was in essence a national law against art about AIDS, and its effects were immediate and profound effectively making the representation of either coitus or AIDS a violation of federal law. But Helms wasn't done. On June 23rd, 1989, he gave a speech on the Senate floor arguing, quote, that instead of denouncing the homosexual lifestyle, countless politicians, some in this chamber, fall in line with a repugnant, organized political movement attempting to persuade American people that this is a desirable way to conduct their lives as thousands more in this country continue to die from AIDS while the homosexual continues to proclaim the virtues of his perverse practices." End quote. No wonder David Wanarovich produced One Day This Kid a few months later. It reads in part, one day politicians will enact legislation against this kid, or one day this kid will talk. When he begins to talk, men who develop a fear of this kid will attempt to silence him with strangling, fists, prison, suffocation, rape, intimidation, drugging, ropes, guns, laws, menace, roving gangs, bottles, knives, religion, decapitation, and immolation by fire. Doctors will pronounce this kid curable as if his brain were a virus. This kid will lose his constitutional rights against the government's invasion of his privacy. All this will begin to happen in one or two years when he discovers he desires to place his naked body on the naked body of another boy." End quote. Four years later, A. A. Bronson, formerly one of the three men who made up the group General Idea, took this photograph immediately after his partner, Felix Parts, had died of HIV infection. He then elected to blow it up to almost billboard size so people couldn't turn away, couldn't avert their eyes. Perfectly capturing the horror of the plague, it's the first image I can remember that transposed the gut-wrenching graphic horror of watching my friends die, so familiar from my daily life in the 20s and 30s into art world terms, into representation. And what a representation. The lively clashing colors and patterns of cloth enlivening everything save the sunken face of the corpse frozen in the unavoidable materiality of death. Yet for all its power and political force, Felix June 5th, 1994 is exactly the obverse of the kind of AIDS art I will address in the rest of this talk. That is to say, I won't be addressing the AIDS activist art we usually see whether ACT UP's brilliant graphics or David Wanarovich's poignant works or the work of furious mourning that's on view in this photograph. Instead, I want to address the many works of art about AIDS that don't look at all like art about AIDS, such as this one, Scott Burton's two-part chair from 1986. Seen from the front, it looks like a sturdy piece of modernist office furniture, and that's exactly what it was for it was available to decorate corporate skyscraper lobbies in Manhattan. But look at it as here from the side, and it tells a different story. Burton's chair insinuates gay sex so obliquely that it deliberately reads as furniture, not politics, a winkingly subversive take engineered to smoothly find its place in the lair of the enemy, such that a businessman could and did sit comfortably on it, unaware of its other implications. And quite movingly, 
Should either half of this chair become separated from its partner, it will fall over and cease to function as a chair. Two quotes from two of the leading AIDS-informed artists of the day, Jenny Holzer and Felix Gonzalez Torres, can help us understand what's going on here. Holzer said in her 1983 to 1985 survival series, among the earliest works of art about AIDS, and I'm showing you some of them, use what is dominant in culture to change it quickly. That's her quote, use what is dominant in culture to change it quickly. Here you can see in her statements printed on condom wrappers, evidence that she practiced what she preached. Her idea was to use what was dominant to change culture quickly, manifest faith in the power of appropriation to infiltrate dominant culture, a primer on how to breach the wall that Helms was so viciously working to construct between two Americas. Tellingly, she here avoids any subcultural address, acknowledging AIDS as a threat across the board. The other quote from Felix Gonzalez Torres amplifies how appropriation, which is after all a kind of strategic amplification of significance, can function as activist. Consider, for example, his Perfect Lovers of 1991, two identical clocks that gradually fall out of sync with one another, made in full consciousness of the artist's loss of his partner, Ross Laycock, that year. Quietly elegiac, but looking so much like a standard museum clock that many visitors didn't even register it as a work of art, the deafness of its political address was nothing if not intentional. As Gonzalez Torres noted in an interview, and I quote him here, you realize quickly that the most effective ideological constructions are the ones that don't look like it. If you say I'm political, I'm ideological, that's not going to work because people know where you're coming from. But if you say, hi, my name is Bob and this is it, then they say, well, that's not political, it's invisible, and it really works, end quote. And then he continued in the same interview, the right is very smart, he said, and that is the one thing that bugs me about artists who are doing so-called gay art and their limitation of what they consider as an object of desire for gay men. When I had a show at the Hirshhorn, Senator Stevens, who was one of the most homophobic anti-art senators, said he was going to come to the opening and I thought he was going to have a really hard time explaining to his constituency how pornographic and how homoerotic two clocks side by side are. He came there looking for dicks and asses, but there was nothing like that. Now you try to see homoeroticism in my piece. As Gonzalez Torres' statement underscores, artists at this time were faced with the stark choice. Under the Helms Amendment, they could make straightforwardly engaged in political art, but the price they paid was exclusion from the mainstream art world. Enjoying from participation in the networks of museums, galleries, and collectors, that is the ladder to success in today's art world. Worse still, overtly dissident work could certainly feed the repressive machinery of the far right, as Gonzalez Torres underscored in his comment about Senator Stevens wanting to politicize his work. The alternative approach entailed camouflaging your political intentions, thus circulating within the museum, I'm sorry, within the mainstream art world, and reaching a vastly greater audience than the more overtly politicized artist ever could. In this 1992 work called Untitled Blood, Gonzalez Torres has the viewer walk through a curtain of blood red beads at a moment of national hysteria about bloodborne HIV transmission. But note there's no direct reference to AIDS to be found in either its title or its imagery. Like all of Gonzalez Torres's work and much of the other work I'll be discussing, its official title is merely untitled. But a parenthetical, here the word blood, helps direct signification with a light touch. No wonder so much AIDS art doesn't look like AIDS art. For ever more draconian laws and ever more subtle art world norms work to outlaw any art that addressed either queerness or AIDS directly. As a result, an entire generation of artists began to think about their representational practices, first and foremost, strategically. Evaluating the array of forces marshaled against them 
while seeking to circumvent, confront, or flout the now codified prohibitions against any representation of AIDS or of same-sex desire. These artists were forced to engage in a complicated calculus, whereby any work of art was tested against a reading of discursive conditions, prejudices, and stereotypes, laws, customs, and institutional parameters to yield the work precisely calibrated to function in the space between possibility and disclosure and foreclosure, influence and censorship. Supremely alive to the discursive affect of their work, this AIDS generation learned expertly how to read the weather, frequently tacking, even dissimulating, if that was what was required. Shortly before his death in 1996, Gonzalez Torres articulated his credo as an artist and an activist. And this is what he said, quote, at this point, I do not want to be outside the structure of power. I don't want to be the opposition, the alternative. Alternative to what? To power? No, I want to have power. It's effective in terms of change. I want to be like a virus that belongs to the institution. All the ideological apparatuses are, in other words, replicating themselves because that's the way culture works. So I function as a virus, an imposter, an infiltrator. I will always replicate myself together with those institutions." End quote. When an HIV positive artist not only allied himself with the virus, but sought to personify it, something important is happening. When HIV infects the body, its evolutionary stroke of genius is to turn the immune system's own defenses against the host. The AIDS virus attaches onto the CD4 white blood cells responsible for fighting infections and inserts its own RNA into these cells. Thus infected, the white blood cell, rather than fighting AIDS, now produces and releases millions of AIDS viruses into the body viruses that then repeat the process with other cells. And because the infection is housed within the host's own white blood cells, the body's remaining healthy disease-fighting cells can't recognize it and thus do not attack. As the immune system is eventually overcome, the host dies from one or another opportunistic infection. In the context of an art world immune system that under pressure of the Helms Amendment, Friend both homosexuality and AIDS as dangerous invaders to be eliminated, numerous artists, beginning with the very first stirrings of what would become a full-scale culture war, pioneered a new viral approach to confronting the exclusionary infection-fighting mechanisms aimed against them. In one of the great historical ironies of the era, these artists took HIV the very virus that was killing them, as the blueprint and the battle plan for a similarly clandestine and camouflaged attack. In their hands, the very glossary of AIDS, words like viral, clandestine, camouflage, infection, became the lexicon of an art world revolution that knew that, like HIV itself, the immune system was the best vector to attack precisely because once infected, it can't attack itself. Formally and theoretically sophisticated, spare and elegant, artists as different as Gonzalez Torres and General Idea evaded the art world's immune system precisely to the degree that their work became the material obverse of a recognizable image of either queerness or AIDS. I'm showing you here General Idea's a year and a day of AZT, conjoining the daily and annual doses of what was then the only approved AIDS drug. In place of hot politics or messy embodiment, a figuration redolent of sex and leaking potentially infected bodily fluids, general idea chose a cool post-minimalist abstraction that, save for the title, seemingly bears no relationship to AIDS, that is, unless you know what AZT looks like. Two years later, General Idea's white AIDS is even more, well, viral, 
The word AIDS, now typographically identical to the word love in Robert Indiana's famous sculpture, printed on each of the canvases in Siri rows, but always in white on white. The canvases are themselves then hung on a white wall, um, filled with white wallpaper, itself repeatedly printed with the word AIDS in white again on white. In its overarching clinical whiteness, AIDS is everywhere in this installation, and yet it remains invisible, obviously indexing a larger social dynamic. Glenn Ligon's untitled, I'm turning into a specter before your very eyes and I'm going to haunt you, is a black requiem that anticipating white AIDS, it was done the year before, grows increasingly illegible as the eye moves down the canvas. Like the word you in its title, it's a shifter. It's meaning a result of the interaction between viewer and artist. That illegibility also animates Anne Meredith's 1987 photographic series of largely black women with AIDS, the first such documentation of women with AIDS in the United States. But when she went back to show her subject this picture, her subject had a change of heart and asked her not to show it, worried that she frankly had enough challenges in her life without becoming the public face of AIDS as well. So they compromised on this work, one in which the subject meticulously scratched out her own face. The pretense that any given work was not about AIDS could be paper thin or even, as in the case of Rudy Lemke, manifestly intended to be found out in his exquisite artist book, Finnate Again's Wake. Its title punning on James Joyce's great experimental novel, Finnegan's Wake, Lemke poignantly multiplies terms associated with ending and with death. Borrowing a strategy from the queer composer John Cage, who deployed Finnegan's Wake for a series of masostics, a poetic format in which a term is spelled down vertically in the middle of a poem, Lemke upended Cage's chance based operations in favor of deliberately searching out words in Joyce's novel that it were resonant of HIV. And then, as you can see here, carefully putting those words in these mesotics. Do you see how he spells the names of AIDS drugs right down the middle? AZT in the first instance, on the left, selecting words resonant of greed, of course, referencing AZT's exorbitant cost, or on the right, it spells phoscarnate, a drug used to treat AIDS-related blindness early in the plague, um, with words, of course, related to sight. Or here, how the artist Jack Pearson takes found letters from trade signs and reassembles them into a cross-reading desire, despair, twinned emotions, for gay men like Pearson in 1996, a year before the first effective AIDS drug regimen appeared. Even as a challenge, then prevalent ideas that AIDS was confined only to certain populations as in anyone. Coterminous with the advent of this viral AIDS art, a new kind of postmodernist criticism is coming to the fore. The central tenet of this new critical tendency was to view the idea of authorship and intention with suspicion, and one short text above all came to assume a position of prominence. Roland Barthes, The Death of the Author. Although, no, although initially published in the legendary American avant-garde journal Aspen in 1967, it would achieve new currency and a permanent spot on college syllabi only if it, after it was anthologized in Barthes' image music text in 1977, the same year as Douglas Crimp's famous pictures exhibition at Artist Space in New York. The group of artists featured in that exhibition, named by Crimp as the pictures generation, emblematized this turn toward a new anti-authoriality through images largely appropriated from the work of other photographers. Countering the common notion that it was the author who determines the meaning of a text, Bart had argued that instead it is us readers who make up any text meaning in the act of reading it. In the death of the author, Bart elevated what he termed readerly activity, the interpretive act 
even going so far as to claim, as the essay's title underscored, that we had no need for authors, since all meanings were inherently made by the audience, were inherently reading, readerly. Despite the fact that Foucault then um, effectively gutted many of Barthes' claims in his much more socially historically grounded what is an author a year later in 1969, the notion of the death of the author proved defining in the development of American art criticism in the 80s. A moment, not coincidentally, I would argue, that also represents something of a high watermark in the policing of the American art world. So when Sherry Levine, as here, photographed Walker Evans' famous Dust Bowl images, first published in Evans and A.G.'s book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, and showed them without commentary as her own work in a 1980 exhibition, at Metro Pictures, simply called after Walker Evans, she was seen as materializing Bart's influential ideas on the death of the author. Although these photographs were originally intended as a form of progressive, politically engaged reportage, albeit in a particularly refined form, and Evans' partner, A.G., underscored their activist intent when he wrote in the foreword to the book, above all else, he wrote, in God's name, don't think of this as art, end quote. Yet no critic at the time noted the peculiar irony of restaging Evans's fervent call for social justice in a postmodernist commentary in the white-walled confines of a commercial art gallery. But then again, since meaning was now declared to be entirely readerly, Levine, in her double irony, even quoted parts of Bart's Death of the Author essay as her own artist statement. Apparently, what Evans and A.G. intended was of little consequence. As the picture's generation's chief critical move, appropriation, became a hallmark of postmodernist art in the early 1980s, it spurred a revolution that derided modernism's ostensible elevation of originality in favor of the appropriated, the contingent, the manifestly ironic or disingenuous. Already at this relatively early stage in its development, we can glimpse the lineaments of what would shortly become postmodernism's post peculiar relation to the social world that it would claim to, demystif to demystify. Ironically, for a critical method rooted in exposing hidden ideological values, apparently postmodernist critic criticism did not see or did not care but these were once activist images. And more to the point, and this is central, that they, that they were activist images would have been viewed as a critical weakness. For activism, with its heavy overlay of authorial intention and its assumption of a linkage between art and social affect, was seen as dangerously naive. A self-consciously activist art reproduced a simplistic account, they argued, of expressive intention that ignored the many ways a statement is always already bound up in a complex web of social meanings that tend to contain, if not vitiate, the prospect of producing social change. Indeed, activist art was often seen as a kind of false consciousness for its implicit claim to a direct, which is to say, unprivileged or unmediated relationship between authorial intent and the social world. But eight changed things. To put it simply, what happens to the death of the author when authors actually begin to die? When it ceases to be mere metaphor? It was, after all, exactly this circumstance that caused Douglas Crimp to quit October's editorial board after 13 years in 1987, publishing a book that aggressively linked his criticism with his activism, even in its title. That book. AIDS, cultural analysis, cultural activism, while illustrating Grand Fury's window in its cover. My point is that AIDS artists, counting on an unorthodox, I'm sorry, on an orthodox postmodernist anti authoriality and a concomitant refusal to credit their intentions, were thus able to seed their work with a range of personal and expressive meanings that they knew a theoretically sophisticated art world trained in the death of the author would not see, or if seen, would not recognize.
At the same time, they also knew that a broad general public would find these other more authorial or political meanings compelling, not least for their connection to traditional artistic values like narrativity or expressivity then in preciously short supply in the postmodern art world. Remarkably, this attitude allowed artists to address AIDS, if done with the right touch, directly under the noses of Philistines like Helms and art sophisticates like Rosalind Krauss, confident that the viral meanings of such art would always operate either above or below their frequencies, either too high or too low to be detected. And even more, the art world could point to the postmodernist theory's denigration of the reality to rationalize its refusal to articulate the now fraught queer and AIDS politics that Helms and company had sought to police. In the context of postmodernism, that same art world could then frame its silence not as cowardice, or an unwillingness to confront, but as the more progressive political position. And here's the kicker. In the face of the presumption that art about AIDS held fast to a woefully untheorized or under-theorized belief in expressivity and intention, an art that refused to articulate a politics around AIDS, AIDS was actually deemed the more engaged, the more of the moment, and finally the more resistant or dissident. It should now be clear that there were two powerful streams converging on AIDS art in the first decade and a half of the epidemic. The aggressively homophobic discourse of a resurgent religious right, enabled by Reagan and Bush, and a much less vituperative but equally chilling theoretical discourse that worked hard to place expressive intent out of bounds, and with it, any dissident account of authorial context, biography, or politics. Together, these two vastly different social forces policed the representation of AIDS, one brutally, the other with kid gloves. But the net effect was that Helms and Krauss, from their opposite perches and with very different agendas, nonetheless produced a virtual art world omerta in the face of the most vicious attack on freedom of expression since McCarthyism in the United States. And once so many authors had died, their double deaths, once literal and once figurative, few remained to puncture that expedient and self-satisfied silence. Indeed, a strategic, fully intentional authorial camouflage constitutes one of the enduring legacies of this AIDS era of art. An AIDS generation taught contemporary artists that making a statement did not necessarily entail forthright admission, and that clues, hints, silences, and illusions could possess, in the right context, an unusually expressive eloquence. Here I'm showing you Andres Serrano's milk blood, looking like nothing so much as hard-edged abstraction after the model of someone like what, Ellsworth Kelly? This photograph has nothing of AIDS about it, save the title. But with that title, we begin to revise our understanding of its formal terms and see that it is also representing two dominant vectors of HIV infection, just like this work, Semen and Blood, does, albeit in this instance looking more like gestural painting. AIDS, in short, brought about a new kind of art, pregnant with associative content, but never declarative, an art that bit its own tongue. Let me illustrate this point. In Untitled Buffalo, even the activist artist David Wanarovich makes a viral work, here photographing a diorama in New York City's Natural History Museum concerning indigenous hunting strategies to suggest, of course, an equivalency between queers and buffalo in the early days of westward expansion, when whites thoughtlessly slaughtered millions and pushed the breed to extinction or near extinction. And here is facing extinction work by Ronald Lockett, a young, prodigiously talented African-American African -American artist born in Bessemer, Alabama, a town named for the Bessemer furnaces used in its steel production. 
As a physically slight, artistically inclined man from a blue-collar, rust-belt community, Locke had kept his illness to himself and only said he had a cold or the flu when anyone asked until his first and sadly fatal bout with pneumonia in 1998. Poor, not formally educated as an artist, albeit utterly convinced of his gifts, Lockett's work is only now emerging into the public eye decades after his death. An image of a lone buffalo in striated sheet metal that's struggling to emerge out of the rust red surface of the work, facing extin extinction, point poignantly echoes the Wonorovich. Yet it's highly unlikely that in 1994, Lockett would have known it. Today, we firmly understand AIDS as a highly politicized disease whose etiology is utterly inseparable from discrimination. In fact, it has become the textbook case of the intersection of social and medical pathology. But before this moment, before AIDS was marked as communal, it was not only solitary, but painfully isolating and debilitatingly secretive. So virulent was the social and political hostility that many people, including Lockett, never once disclosed their zero status. And US newspapers were filled with euphemisms about unmarried young men who died after a short respiratory illness. Dying of AIDS wasn't something to mourn, it was something to hide. Before an activist community aggressively fought back against this refusal to name and specify AIDS, and in the process forged a wildly successful collective politics around the disease, AIDS was in the closet just as surely as homosexuality had been several generations before. Yet the same imagery manages to bridge the enormous gulf between an urban, professional, largely middle-class, majority white AIDS activist culture and the very different trials of a black man living with AIDS in the rural South. It can do so precisely because there is a shared collective recognition around the idea of the American Buffalo and its bloody history, a history that connects these two very different artists. Frank Moore's masterful lullaby then appropriates this self-same appropriated buffalo and sets it to graze on the sheets of a hospital bed in winter. This image then contains yet another appropriation, this time of arguably the most emblematic work of AIDS art ever made, Gonzalez Torres's untitled bed, one of a number of billboards that sprouted in New York without any initial commentary looking, frankly, more like a sophisticated, sophisticated ad campaign for Bed Bath and Beyond than any work of art. Only gradually did the work's significance dawn, and this bed with its empty impression of two bodies accrued slowly power as a sign of all we had lost. Then Joy Episala's bed number on pillow number five pushes off from Gonzalez Torres's elevated, pristine white bed, now placing the pillows on the floor, making one dirty, putting one pillow atop the other in a much more socially historically accurate recognition of the conditions of AIDS in America. Then Ronnie Horn's gold mats paired for Ross and Felix. It's coming up momentarily, I hope. Oops, there we go. Oh, we seem to have a problem. Um, Hang on, I'm bringing it up. Okay, you great. can just continue, I'll bring it up. Great. Um, then Ronnie Horn's gold mats paired for Ross and Felix exploits the same idea of a pairing and of sheets in tribute to Felix, who would himself succumb to AIDS the year after this work was completed. It takes advantage of the mechanical properties of thinly beaten gold leaf with its attraction and repulsion and susceptibility to shift in response to a viewer's movements. And thus, this work is as sensitive to the viewer's presence as Gonzalez Torres's was, albeit in a different key. And here you can see those are two 
thinly beaten gold sheets on top of one another. And if you walk past it, it just moves. Then Dean Samashima, an artist who was a generation younger and who literally grew up with AIDS, takes the very same image vocabulary and turns its resonance from loss and death to life and pleasure. Here photographing the beds in bathhouses where he had sex with random strangers, pointing to a continuing unapologetic eroticism, even in the face of the plague. My point is that there is a dialogue in and through these images going on here. Soto voce, if you concentrate, you can hear it. And it bespeaks collectivity and politics. Let's take as an example, Gonzalez Torres's largest candy spill, Untitled Placebo from 1991, a work that like the other candy spills, invites the audience to take and eat a piece of candy thereby inaugurating an act of threefold significance. As a resistance to the highly politicized othering of people with AIDS, as an echo of Catholic communion, and as a literal contact with the infected at a moment when AIDS protocols still work powerfully to isolate people with AIDS. But at 1,200 pounds, it is by far the largest of these types of work, and its massive silvery elegance makes it one of the most beautiful. But here, the parenthetical in the title, placebo, also instantiates a problem. Why use a term that in pharmaceutical studies refers to the ineffective substitute of a drug that's supposed to work? And why is placebo at a scale that totally dwarfs the other candy spills? To hear the Gonzales Torres Foundation tell it, this is mere happenstance with no political intent, a reading frankly now echoed across the art world. But according to the CDC itself, the upper limit of the CD4T helper cells that are the initial target of the HIV virus is about 1,200, exactly the same weight as the weight in pounds of placebo. As we are invited to take and consume the candy, that number, of course, diminishes just as the body's CD4 cells themselves diminish following infection. And as we eat the candy, we are the ones responsible for the destruction of this immune system, a political charge nonetheless leveled with the gentlest touches. But if the scale of the work is related to an optimal healthy CD4 count, why then call it placebo? In this context, the artist himself was eloquent noting in a 1993 interview with reference to his then deceased partner, Ross Laycock, quote, Freud said that we rehearse our fears in order to lessen them. In a way, this letting go of the work, this refusal to make a static form, a monolithic sculpture in favor of a disappearing, changing, unstable, and fragile form, was an attempt on my part to rehearse my fears of having Ross disappear day by day, right in front of my eyes, end quote. So according to this frame of reference, placebo operates as a placebo for the artist's own loss, a means of rehearsing his grief before the real horror of loss could take hold. As Gonzales probably intended, untitled placebo has become at once an irritant and a joy, a riddle to be solved and something to be valued purely in aesthetic terms. But all versions of this work, my interpretation and the Felix Gonzalez Torres' foundations must ultimately bow before the social situation placebo engenders. That social experience, that act of encounter at once collective and individual calls upon some of us so inclined to plumb its possible depths while at the same time letting others enjoy it as generous and even democratic a celebration of an art that invites rather than excludes. On this latter form of meaning, too, Gonzalez Torres is eloquent. And it's worth quoting him at length to convey something of his emotional tenor. He said, quote, when I saw the show, there was one particular guard who was standing with the big candy floor piece entitled Placebo, and she was amazing. There was this suburban white middle-class mother with two young sons who came into the room 
And in 30 seconds, this woman, who was a black, maybe church-going civil servant in Washington, in the middle of all this reactionary pressure about the arts, there she was explaining to this mother and kid about AIDS and what this piece represented, what a placebo was, and how there was no cure and so on. Then the boys started to fill their pockets with candies. And she sort of looked at them like a schoolmistress and said, you're only supposed to take one. Just as their faces fell and they tossed back all but a few, she suddenly smiled again and said, okay, well, maybe two. And she won them over completely, he continued. The whole thing worked because they then got the piece. They got the interaction, they got the generosity, and they got her. It was great, end quote. In this account, AIDS, social interaction, generosity, forms of race and class inversion, and the sheer force of the guard's personality all conspire to animate a work of art about AIDS for children. In the context of AIDS plague and the forced othering that our enemies sought to engender, here is art that reaches across the aisle and touches or better invites our touch. It does not seek to segregate some experiences and meanings from others, for experience itself is an undifferentiated state, only hierarchized upon reflection. Children above all know this, and so they were the artist's model in talking about the work. My point is that these works of art address us hopefully seeking relationship, and not just relationship, but a form of contact, a visceral and embodied relationship. Relational aesthetics doesn't know where it began, but it began here, in a socio-political context, in which the mere act of touching was so fraught, so loaded with the terrors of contamination and infection that it became a political act. While most AIDS activists are tended towards the confrontational, unintentionally reifying the divide between us and them, here and there. That very divide that Helms and company were so busy stoking, this viral art instead held fast to faith in collectivity and community. So that even a work of art about AIDS spoke to children in a language they could understand. Under plague conditions, a viral art not only brought us together, but it made that fraught contact over into, for, into a form of politics that didn't divide, but unify. My point is that strategically speaking, we are all the children of AIDS, even those of us who disown any knowledge of it, that I can still speak of a collective, of a we, after the experience of AIDS is evidence of its discursive success. Read, if you can, the ephemeral word behind Jimmy DeSana's extraordinary late photograph, Gooseberries, who was dying at the time he made it. But if you look closely, you'll see what it, can re what it reads, deathlessness. A dying man photographed deathlessness because he knew we would read it long after he was gone the word barely visible behind the lanterns that illuminate the image. In the face of his demise, after so much suffering, Dasana knew that in our looking at this photograph, some of us would register a paradoxical, hopeful sadness, while some of us would see nothing but the lanterns themselves. He knew that he, the artist, would die, but that his voice and the collective the community, and that saw and registers the voice, that would live on, damning those who predicted, even encouraged, our extinction. The final triumph, it seems, is his. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me? Yes. That was so beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit in shock. <laughs> that was just so powerful and so beautiful and poetic and political and everything. 
Um, and I think it was totally convincing and I wanna hear um, from other people. So please, um, I invite everybody to write questions or comments into the chat in Google and then, or um, YouTube, and then I will read them out loud. Um, but I think that, you know, this idea of, I mean, there's just so much to, to unpack here or to, to sort of grapple with, I guess. Um, the idea of artists functioning like a virus and working invisibly and sort of working under the surface and just how, how threatening that is. Um, I think that um, one question that I, that I had was about the relationship between appropriation, um, artistic appropriation, and whether you were um, really making it, maybe, and maybe you were and I missed it, but making really making a connection between um, that, the strategy of appropriation and the idea of contagion. It's, it's absolutely the case that, um, that there's a play with the strategy of contagion, um, that it's thematized in so many of these works through various acts of taking and of reciprocation. And that one of the things that these AIDS artists were looking to do was of course, to break that initial barrier, which was being promoted by culture almost across the board, that AIDS was untouchable. And so of course, appropriation was one means of so doing. Mm. And, I, and I also should say that, and, and this is something that I didn't bring up, but I, I really wanna stress that I think there's something quite significant that this strategy of an anti-authorial death of the author kind of postmodernism is emerging at a precisely the moment in American culture when long silenced voices are beginning to be heard. When queers, when civil rights, when activist forms of art are finally claiming territory, boom, all of a sudden, right, it no longer becomes theoretically sophisticated to pay attention to authorial intent. And I right. frankly, call me paranoid, but I see a connection there. Um. I was also interested in what you said right at the end about touching becoming a political act. And um, because I was thinking about that when you showed the Gonzalez Torres, the blood piece, which is an incredible piece. And I was of course thinking about touch when I was looking at that. Um, I think especially because of living in the age of COVID, it's like, oh my God, is it, are people really gonna walk through that now? Um, I don't know. I just I didn't know if you want to talk more about that. Well, I, I will say that that when I saw it installed, one of the striking things I saw was people hesitating before they could go through the curtain. They had to like screw up their courage to do so. They knew it was just plastic beads, but it was still so visceral. And Gonzalez Torres makes a very interesting demand on institutions that show the work. He doesn't care how it's going to be shown. In other words, it can be in any opening, but it has to cover the complete opening so that there's no way around it. You have wow. to walk. That's so powerful. Would you, um, looking to see if there are any questions. Does anybody have any questions or comments? <laughs> I see Home King saying, beautiful talk, Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan Pinkett you, says, yo, John. Jonathan Pinkett <laughs> says, yo, John. And John Willis <laughs> says, yay. <laughs> um, I mean, do you think that it's right, that it's like fair to say that, um, you know, if you said that AIDS was in the closet, that this art um, was in the closet? Yeah, I mean, I, in many respects, of course, by design, this art was in the closet, right? And, um, and what I find so striking is that when we think about AIDS art, we tend to think about activist art. And this whole other genre that I would argue represents the vast bulk of art about AIDS doesn't get considered. I mean, it was, it was so convincing. And um, as, somebody who previously thought that there just wasn't that much AIDS art out there. 
I mean, now I now I I see it every I see it totally differently. And um, I now, say, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. no, no I, was just, no. I was just going to say that the you know one of the striking aspects here is that the Felix Gonzalez Forest Foundation um, has long worked to prohibit any kind of discussion of AIDS or the politics of Felix's work, which I find obviously reprehensible. Wow. Um, but when I was negotiating and ultimately um, failing to get loans of Felix's work for Art Aids America, um, uh, one of the things that they told me was that there was no more AIDS content to Felix's work than there was content about the troubles in Northern Ireland. That his work wow. was about all forms of conflict. And I kept thinking, the hell planet are you on, right? But that's the way the art world still operates. Right, and right, and as if you can control that meaning. Yeah. Um, okay, here's some questions. Matt Feliz is, says, "Thanks so much for this powerful talk. I was especially I was especially taken by your discussion of camouflage, and the way in which camouflage plays with the relationship between figure and ground." Thank you. Hongzhen Han says, thank you, Dr. Katz. What an amazing talk. Can you relate the discrimination of the queer community during the AIDS epidemic to the increasing anti-Asian sentiment during COVID-19? Absolutely. I mean, as I tried to suggest at the beginning, the one thing we know from epidemics is that they are going to reify extant social hierarchy and they're going to produce ever more powerful social technology. Um, and so what we see now is a contemporary victimization, um, which has to locate, right, under, under scourge, under epidemic, you have to locate, right, some source, some origin, something, something that can be othered so that you can be safe. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, now it's Asians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boundaries, categories. Um, David Kim says, for many of the works you show, the title serves as a point of entry. Could you comment on the role of the, the linguistic marking of the work? Yes, I think in many respects, what this art sought to do, of course, had it not had those titles, I wouldn't have been doing a lot of the interpretive work that I was able to do. It clued me in and it clued a lot of other people in into what the work was sort of picturing, working towards. But importantly, titles are often not read by museum goers. And so museums could also put this work on the wall, confident that they wouldn't be in any obvious way violating the Helms prescriptions or in other words, showing art about AIDS or homosexuality. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'm waiting for more questions, but um, not seeing any more coming in. So might be a good time to wrap up, um, but I think that you can continue, you know, leaving leaving comments and questions here um, in the chat. Um, oh, wait, here comes one, Lisa Saltzman. Jonathan, given that the word influenza holds with it the idea slash etymology of influence, as an art historian, would you want to make a larger claim about notions of influence in art history? A good one. Very interesting, very complicated question. Very Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I think the way I would answer it is by saying this, that, um, that the idea of making meaning often requires input through influences. Um, and that we have to understand something fundamental about art that I think is not well understood, 
which is that art speaks to multiple audiences with multiple competencies. Some of us, art historians, right, know influences, others don't. And one of the things that's so extraordinary about art is its ability to communicate to everybody in that list, those who are extraordinarily aware of the uh, influences and those who have no knowledge whatsoever. That is, in fact, the sort of democratic possibility of art and one of the reasons I love it so. Hmm. So you were saying before we started that you thought that there might be some, um, I don't know, sort of pushback against what you were saying from the audience. I did. So I anticipated it. Yeah, yeah. Come on, guys. Come on, people. What I, what I was anticipating was would, would be that there would be pushback at the idea that I was advocating a form of art that wasn't aggressively dissident and resistant, but was instead, um, you know, in some ways, through its use of appropriation and other terms, uh, could be misunderstood as complicit. Um, but I think what needs to be said about that critique is that the context of the 1980s and early 1990s was such that we can't judge that art by the standards. Right. Maybe that I mean, can prove. After, after listening to your talk, I see it as totally activist art, just very sneaky, just very clever okay. and sneaky and insidious. <laughs> Um, David Kim, Jonathan, have you? Uh, oh, sorry, there are a couple before David's. Uh, Fran Francesca, Bolfo. I'm thinking about the buffalo as a polysemic symbol. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. That signifies varyingly different viewers. Can we see this kind of visual dialogue as a sort of chain? of metonymic signifiers endlessly pointing to something that cannot be articulated or simply as part of a coded language. That's beautifully put, Francesca. And yes, that's exactly the point, right? Um, for some people, right, the buffalo is going to be literal. For some people, it's going to be a kind of argument about uh, whites and indigenous populations. For some people, it's going to be about queers and the Republicans, and that it can be all those things at once is, in fact, the point. And its encouragement is not towards no mean, which is what postmodernist criticism would say, oh, it's just an individuated meaning and everybody has different meanings. No. It means according to certain tendencies, certain social constructions or arguments then current. And we group or understand our meanings um, based in part upon our own life experiences. And of course, we can have multiple meanings, right? Some of us can, can see intersectional connections and others of us can't. Hmm. David Kim says, Jonathan, have you identified similar strategies in the art produced beyond the US? It's very interesting. Um, there is um, a connection to the art produced, for example, in England and Germany at the time, but um, it seems to me that it's the most pronounced in America precisely because the federal and local conditions were most hostile. It's striking to me, for example, that, you know, when Helms produced that amendment, 94 to two, right? That's what it was to live in America at this time. To feel like the community in which I existed, um, a community that had seen nothing but horror and death, a community in which, you know, my 20 year old self was having the same conversations that my great grandmother was having about funerals and uh, memorial services. And at that time, right, there was almost no recognition of the horror that we were going through. And the, that, that division of the United States 
was profoundly unnoted by anybody who wasn't part of this cadre. Has the argument that you're making, that you made tonight, um, has has it been has it has it been expressed in any of your exhibitions? So, Art Aids America was, in some sense, uh, an attempt to illustrate this. Yeah, it was. but I've right. continued to work on it and develop it, and will eventually push it in other directions. Um, but I'm also sort of, I'm I'm interested in thinking more about something that I confess I slighted, which is the role of forthright activist art and whether it in fact does what a postmodernist critique says it does, which is to reinforce boundaries and continue to produce conflict um, in which both sides of the equation are reinforced in their opposition. I, I need to think more about that and I'm just beginning to. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been just incredibly stimulating and um, a lot to think about here. And you will be back tomorrow um, to to chair one of the sessions of the of the symposium. So um, to everybody walk, watching, um, please join us tomorrow. We've got three sessions. I think we start at ten o'clock. You can find the program. Um, here, if you scroll down on YouTube, and you can also find it on our website. Um, so thanks to everybody for listening and for your questions. And thank you so much, Jonathan. You gave us all um, so much to think about. Beautiful talk. <laughs>